Holy Spirit, we just call on you right now for your wisdom. Your, the word says that you are our teacher and you instruct us. And you, um, your word also says that if anyone lacks wisdom, just to ask. And so we're just asking for wisdom. We love wisdom. Lord, yes. we love wisdom. Let's just say that together. We, we love, love wisdom. wisdom. I love wisdom. I love wisdom. I love wisdom. And so, Father, that's what we're looking for today. And we just, we just open ourselves up to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, Jace or uh, Josh, we'll, go ahead and t we'll do the table. I just got too much stuff to set down. No, 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 the, the black one, if you don't mind, sir. Carl knows. All right. Um, here's one. Okay, so if you want to text during during the service, you can, and uh, and we'll get it. And nobody do anything weird, okay? Send me any weird stuff because I'll see it and I'll probably start laughing. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. Now it's gonna happen. In retrospect, you know, it, my dad always told me, "Son, hindsight's always twenty 20. He's right. Does any, anybody know what that means? Okay. Yeah, we got a lot of young people here, so. Thank you. Oh, such oh, good men. Yes. You guys give these guys a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Yeah, that's going to make it a lot easier. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So one of the first questions, we've been doing a series on relationships. And thank God this is the last Sunday. <laughs> How many of you have been challenged in your relationships ever since we started Ooh. this series? Man. Day after. <laughs> and it's not stopped. <laughs> but it's whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I don't think that's true. I actually want to kill the person that said that. <laughs> anyway, okay. We got one uh, that says question ministry, but I don't know what that means. And so if you want to retype that and resend it, you can. Don't speak up and tell me it'd be too much. Okay. Um, here's one. This is a good one. And th these are mainly about relationships, but if you have any question, other questions, you can ask them too and see if we can get to them. How do you let go of your kids and not feel empty? That is a great question. You want me to start? You do whatever you want. Okay. Well, I've, I've been experiencing, answer, okay, I've been experiencing the, sim the similar oh. thought because my children are 14, 15, and 16. So, my son's about to be 17. And, and so we've been talking a lot about their future and their purposes and, you know, getting married and all those fun things. And actually, two of our children are learning how to drive. So that's been a real challenge for me internally because in my mind, I have to put fear down that I'm allowing I'm about to allow my son, who still likes to climb on trees and jump out of branches, and I still have to tell him, don't do that, get down off of there. I, I, but I tell him, go ahead. <laughs> I wonder how high you can fall and not break something. <laughs> I'm like, how am I going to let this child be on the road by himself? <clears throat> so actually, I've been having this internal discussion with Holy Spirit about letting my children grow up. And at times, there's this feeling inside of me of sadness because, you know, I'm, we're walking out of one stage in life into another stage in life. And so Holy Spirit's just been talking to me a lot about how this is natural and this is the way that the Lord um, intended things. The, the Word says that um, a man shall leave his mother, mother and father and cleave to his wife. Yeah. And so... And you know that that was a prophetic statement. I didn't know because that. Because when Adam said that, mm -hmm. he didn't have a natural mother and father. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's just interesting. And so he's been talking to me a lot about how um, allowing your children to grow up and actually stewarding them into the, uh, the calling and the grace that's on their life, is there's major reward in fruit there that we as parents get to enjoy. And so I've been trying to really, really um, focus on what we're getting ready to step into. I mean, we're getting ready to step into our children, meeting their spouses, um, and getting to be uh, parents of not just our own children, but getting to love our, 
our new children that are coming into our family and and just looking forward to the season that God's taking us into because we can't look at it like, oh, things are about to get worse. We have to look at it, oh, things are about to get even better because Jesus said in the Word that, or Paul said, we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And that means that as our children grow up and as they actually begin to learn how to function on their own and go off to school, that this should mean that things are getting better and better and better because we're going from faith to faith and glory to glory. And if your children aren't making good decisions right now, because I know that um, that's a real issue and we have to to deal with our children not always making good decisions, um, I begin to just focus on declaring the, the word of God over them in that area. And I begin to just speak who they are in Christ and not what the problem is. So if your children currently are not making good decisions, then I would encourage you to just full force go after the, the scriptures that speak to what he, that child needs to be doing and not what he actually is doing. Because the word says that you can call those things that be not as though they were. And that's what we do with our children. And we're just going to see our children and partner with Father and see our children just do great things for God. And get excited about their future. Get excited about what God's going to do through them. And that, to me, will help to exchange those feelings of fear and loss and turn it into, oh my goodness, we're getting ready to increase. We're getting ready to to actually have more in our life. So, You can't can't get growth from a seed until you plant it. Last time I checked, if you keep it in your hand, it won't grow. It'll mold and... There's a point in time when you have to put it in the ground. Yeah. And then you have to release it and believe that the care and the affection and the trust and everything you put into that seed is going to take root and grow. Yeah. And the word says, um, train up a child in the way they should go. Yeah. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, I believe old means when he leaves my home. That's when old is. Since there is no t- uh, uh, number attached to that, I get to choose. So, anyway. And I want to also end with this on that. Um, that really encourage your children, no matter what age they are, to pursue their purpose. Even if they're 20s, 30s, 40-year-old children, um, just feed that in them. Pursue your purpose. We're, we're feeding that into our children right now. What is your purpose? You run in your race, and God will bring that right person along beside you. So stay focused on what he's called you to do and allow him to bring that person into your life at the right time. So, Amen. Okay, here's one. You can, read it. you can read it. Is it okay to argue in front of your children? That's a great question. A great it's question. It's just, that's, let me just give you what another minister said. John Osteen, he was preaching one time, and <clears throat> they were very open and transparent about their relationship with their church. This was Joel's dad, okay? And uh, he was, he, I encourage you to go back and get some of his messages. He just, he's, he was crazy, fire preaching, pastor, loved people. But he said, he said, we just live like we live in front of you, just like we do at home. We fuss and fight and kick and scream right in front of our children. They know exactly what we do. That was his answer. So I'm not saying it's mine, but I'm trying to shift blame to him because you can't contact him anymore. He's with the father. So yeah, to add to that, you know, I mean, obviously we don't want to have an argument in front of our children, but we can't pause life and say, you know what? Step out of the car because mommy and daddy have to have a discussion right now. I mean, they've been in the midst of some intense conversations that we have had with each other. And obviously it's not ideal. That's not what we want to do. But here's what we really try to always do. If one of us does something we shouldn't, like if we're in an argument and we raise our voice or, you know, we, it gets too intense or something, and the children are around and they hear it, we always take a moment and say, you know what, mom and dad were just wrong. We were wrong right there. We, we missed it. We shouldn't have said this, that, or the other. And if we're wrong with our children, like the other day, Trent and I, we butted heads about something, and I, I started the conversation off wrong. I'm the one that made it the way it was because I went after him with intensity, and I was angry with him, but I didn't even give him a chance to communicate before I just wailed on him. And so what I did was I said, you know what? Stop. I'm sorry. 
I'm wrong. I made this conversation tense. And what that did was it just took all the, the weight off of him. And, you know, he, we just both hugged and just got, got right back right again. And so, yeah, you're going to sometimes have arguments and discussions in front of your children because you can't stop life and your kids live with you. And if you're like our family, our kids are always with us just about, and, um, which bothers Barry sometimes. <laughs> I'm joking. He wants more alone time. Um, but, you know, if, if it happens, if you argue in front of your children and things get out of hand, just recognize that it's okay to say in front of your kids, we were wrong, we apologize. Because then they know, hey, sometimes you do do things wrong, but as long as, you know, you know it, you recognize it, you own it, and you make it right. Andrew Carnegie wrote a great book. <clears throat> it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's on audiobook and everything. I encourage you to get it and listen to it. Uh, it'll benefit you a lot more than country music. Um, but, or whatever. It's, it's really good. But one of the things he says is, when you know you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. And so I try to do that. Um, I, and I'm not saying, we're not up here saying we've got it all together. We're right about everything, okay? Don't think that for a second. Some people, you may very much disagree with arguing in front of your kids. While we don't think it's the best thing, uh, sometimes, like she said, life doesn't slow down. But going back and admitting that you're wrong, uh, if you, if I'll speak to dads, if your dads won't, if you have a hard time admitting that you're wrong, your kids will have a hard time admitting they're wrong. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And yeah. just let me give you on this little highlight here: everybody's wrong. Yeah. Everybody's been wrong. Yeah. And so, if you're sitting there. Uh, saying that, well, no, I haven't been, then evidently we have Jesus with us today. <clears throat> and he's not at the right hand of the Father, and I'd like to talk to you after service. But so when I'm wrong, I'll go back to Amy and say, you know what? I was really wrong. You were right about that. And that's hard to say, too, especially if, if you're having to put down pride, which we all do. You were right. I was wrong. But it will, it will build you up, and it will actually make you better at it. And so, and it'll help your children say, hey, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to tell people when you're wrong and own your stuff. That's so, right. All right. Um, so we had a couple for kids there. And then, uh, this, is good, this is good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. What does it look like to set healthy boundaries? And at what point in time is a relationship toxic? That's a good question. We're going to save this for next service. <laughs> I didn't know if somebody texted. Wow. Okay, what does it look like to set healthy boundaries? Hmm. It looks different for everybody. It's going to look, yeah, I, well, I completely agree with that. It's going to look different for everybody. I really think that obviously communication is of the utmost importance in every relationship, whether it be between a spouse or children or friendships. And so, um, you know, the best thing that I know to do when it comes to setting healthy boundaries is to make your spouse or your, your friend or um, whomever aware of when you feel hurt. And don't do it in a way that just puts the blame back on them. Do it in a way, communicate in a way that says that when you said this, this is how it made me feel. And so I want to communicate with you that sometimes I feel controlled. And I'll, can I use an example? <laughs> okay, because this has to do with boundaries. She didn't wait for me to answer. Okay, um, so I don't you know, know what's about this to has said. to do with admitting when you're right and wrong or whatever. Oh, okay. And the other day, Barry and I had another just opportunity, and we were working through it. And he has um, he's working through being able to allow me to come to my own admission of when I'm wrong. In the past, that's been more difficult for him because because of some things that he's working out in his own life that he doesn't want to be taken advantage of and he, you know, doesn't want me to never come back to him and say I was wrong about something. So instead of giving me freedom to do that, he actually wants me to admit right then when I'm wrong and he encourages me to do that. And so, um, but I mean, and you can tell on me too, sweetie. Okay, I'm <laughs> fair game. Okay, I'm fair game. I'm going to start writing some stuff. Just now. go ahead. Let's just be real. Okay. Somebody bring me a pen. And I was really irritated about this. And so I, I got away from him for a few minutes and Holy Spirit started revealing to me why I felt like this. And he first of all 
told me that it's because um, it's a control issue and that, that we need to come to terms with that. And secondly, he said, you need to be better at admitting that you're wrong. And, and so he won't feel so afraid that I'm not going to admit that I'm wrong. So I told him, I came back to him and I said, this is why I don't like it when you do this, because I feel like you're trying to control me instead of letting me naturally come to a place of admitting that I'm wrong. Um, and so I, I, I communicated that in love with him. I did, I talked to him calmly about that. And then secondly, I said, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to commit to you that whenever I'm wrong, I will admit that I'm wrong. If you will give me freedom to come to that on my own terms, I promise I will never not come back to you and tell you when I was wrong about something. And so um, identifying boundaries, identifying the way certain communication uh, rubs you the wrong way, or if um, your spouse or your child or your friend consistently uh, barges through your comfort zones or your, you know, sometimes we have a bubble and we... Um, like to keep certain things private and people sometimes barge in on that. You just have to communicate. So the best way I know to set a healthy boundary is to identify the situation or the way it makes you feel and then communicate it in love to the person that you're in relationship with. Um, and at what point in time is a relationship toxic? And I would say that a relationship is toxic when both people could care less about the health of the relationship. And if neither one of you are willing to admit your own faults and put aside selfishness so that the other person can feel loved and protected, then you may have an issue with, um, you know, toxic toxicity or such in your relationship. And if that's the case, um, one of you has to be the bigger person. So there's and, something else in that. Yeah, go ahead. With what is, Just think of... A, uh, a sewer line and a water main running together, running close together in proximity. Yeah. And the soil begins to corrode the pipes and the, the sewer line breaks and it starts leaking toxic uh, things into the water. Let me ask you a question. How much of that water do you want to drink? Oh, come on. Yeah. So is that none? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Now, love, in Proverbs, two references in Proverbs, says it covers a multitude of sins. But it doesn't say it hangs around and continues to get beat up. Wow. Come on now. And so if you are really wanting to make a relationship healthy, but the other person does not, is not interested in that, and wants to continue in a cycle of destruction, then you're going to have to set a boundary and say... No more. I love That's you, so but no more. That's so good. And it could be with your mom. It could be with your dad, sibling, sister, what, sibling or boyfriend, girl, whatever. It could be any relationship. Yeah. And however, when you're married, it's a little bit more delicate. And you have to be led of Holy Spirit when it's time for there to be a separation. You know, we've, we've, uh, I told you my story last week, um, you know, about having, <clears throat> having been married before. And um, I really believe, you know, I might be more open about that in the future because uh, I think it believe, brings freedom to some people. But um, th that relationship was very, very, very toxic. Um, so much so that if you have strongholds from the past that are bad, that abuse is okay, abuse is love. Because some people think that. Yeah. They think if they're not being abused, they're not being loved. Yeah. I know a lot of people think, well, that's totally weird, unhealthy. But we're all totally weird, unhealthy in some ways. Yeah. If we'll just be honest. And in that relationship, because of that, the history that they had, I wasn't being everything they thought I should be if I wasn't being abusive. And so, but I was a jerk too. I was a grade A, triple star, whatever, five star jerk. And so I was toxic as well. But um, there came a point where we just had to, well, it wasn't, it got, it just got bad. But, <clears throat> so you have to, you're going to have to determine that. We've got a lot of questions okay. we got to get Keep through. Keep moving forward, okay.
What, uh, no, that's Here's not really a question. Yeah, the ones that come in the text, since you're in the service, we're going to try to catch those. Um, well, it says, we read the whole thing. Sure. Okay, it says, Barry and Amy, you're amazing leaders. Do you have a recommendation? Thank you. Thank it's actually you. nice so to get that, a compliment. Thank you. Um, feeling pretty, I just want to stay in this moment for a second. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you get a bright spot in your day, stay there as long as you can until the light Amen. goes out. Amen. Uh, do you have a recommendation for a book that tells background or the setting of the stories? I'm, I'm not sure if you mean the stories that we tell. We have not written a book about our stories. Uh, but as far as leadership stories, like, you know. I think a good book. Okay, leaders. Yep. I'll tell you the book that changed my life. Do it. Love Works by Joel Manby. It is a short, easy-to-read book. Joel Manby is the CEO of Hershen Family Entertainment, which they run about uh, 18 or 19 family entertainment parks like Silver Dollar City, Stone Mountain, things like that, Dollywood, whatever. And he wrote a book based on how the Hershen family ran their business. And it's based on um, 1 Corinthians 13, four through six, what love does, and how that translates to the corporate marketplace. Well, I knew that I had to adjust some things in my leadership and quit being such a um, hard leader. And so by reading and listening to that, it really helped me adjust some things and learn how to lead better. And that was about three and a half years ago. And, you know, there's some people that are, there's natural born leaders. They just, they lead. Whatever, can, wherever they go, they lead. And it's not that they're trying to be prideful and do it. They just lead. That's what they do. Um, then there's learned leaders that learn to lead and pick up on it well. And there's a latent leader that is not a natural born leader or a learned leader, but they kind of pick up on it as they go. And so um, my dad is a, a natural born leader. That's how he raised me. And so when I get into a situation, if there's no apparent leadership, I'm going to step in and I'm going to try to help. It's not because I'm trying to take charge. It's just we're all built differently. And so... Uh, but when you are that way, when you've had any measure of success in the old way of leading, you think that's the right way and you're not necessarily open to change. That's a big mistake. Yeah. You've got to be open to change. So that, that really helped us, helped us both. Yeah, it did. And here's something that you got to know from the get go. And we kind of didn't, I didn't realize this when we started in ministry, but leading is painful. Well, that's the truth. It's just, you cannot avoid pain in leading. In fact, it, there is, you know, there's a lot of highs. There's a lot of awesome things about getting to lead, um, getting to pastor. But there are a lot of painful things that come along with it. And what it does in the midst of that is it really, really um, allows you to see your motives and why you're doing what you're doing. And so if you don't love people, if you don't genuinely love people, when it starts costing you and when it's painful, you're going to, you're going to fail. You're going to crumble. You're going to walk away from it. And so, um, uh, stories, so they, they retexted stories from the Bible that would help. I'll tell you this. I would study Moses. He is one of the greatest leaders in the old Testament. Uh, he and Elijah were, were both watermarks of power and authority. Moses walked in a great deal of authority. Elijah walked in a great, Elijah, not Elisha, even though Elisha was great. Elijah was the watermark of power. Both of those men visited Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Do you remember that? Why? Because they both had gone home to be with God without dying a natural death. They were, gonna, they were educating Jesus and they were helping him on the journey that he was about to take. Why them? Because they were the watermarks of authority and power in the Old Testament. So I encourage you to study their lives. And I recommend Joshua and King David. Both of them led the out... The thing about Joshua and King David, they were both killers. Okay, yeah. You, you got to know the person's life. Joshua, King David was a killer, man. He was rough. <laughs> I'm just telling you. But he was tender. He, he was time. tender to God, but he was rough on people. Well, I don't know that he was rough on people, but... Well, I've seen him kill people in the Bible. But they were enemies of God. I've anyway, seen him kill people that were close me, to him. Let me say Sorry. what I need to say. Okay, so Joshua and Caleb both had an undying, unwavering hunger for the presence of the Lord. Yes, they did. And they, uh, they went after that more than they went after anything else. So leading, to me, always needs to be um, done out of a uh, connection with God's presence in his heart. Because 
there's going to be times when things happen that you don't understand, when people are against you, but you're just trying to do your, God's will and people are coming against you. And the only way you can sustain in those kind of moments is to be in the presence of the Father and for Him to say, you know what? Leading costs you your life. Really being a Christian costs you your life. You know, Jesus did the Father's will and He got crucified for it. Yeah. So people just need to keep that in mind. <laughs> Gabriel visited... visited um, Mary and said hello Mary highly favored one the word highly favored one is the same word as um, I believe it's in Romans or I could, where it says uh, that you are accepted in the beloved everyone's accepted in the beloved accepted in the beloved and highly favored are the same Greek word The favor that came in Mary's life also brought a lot of trouble to her. Yeah. You got a young girl about to get married, and now she's pregnant in a culture that says, no way, Jose, man, we will kill you. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of times the favor of God on your life will bring a lot of, a lot of people out against you. So just be, just be aware of it. We got loads of good I know. Let's Here's, sure. let's, okay. Do you think that dating is better than having lots of boyfriends and girlfriends? Here's what I think. Okay, you ask the question, you're going to get the straight poop. I think dating lots of people sets you up for an easy divorce. Because every time you date someone and break up, you make it a little bit easier to leave. Did you hear that, Trin? Did you hear that, Olivia? Just thumbs up. Thank you. Tristan and Maya. And all, the other, and all our other children back there. <laughs> Did you get that, Chad? Or I just make it sure. Yeah. Um, Chad, you don't have any, you know, but anyway. Here's, here's, what, here's, here's what I think, because I know there's two sides to this. But um, I'm, I'm going to stay on the we'll this side way. of, yeah, of honestly, the Lord can, if it is your desire to only date the person you're supposed to marry and to not go through a bunch of heartache and a bunch of, you know, wrong suitors and potentially put yourself in a place of temptation over and over again, you can ask the Lord to, um, to just shut that down in your heart until you meet that person that you're supposed to marry. And I know this from a personal experience. All throughout my teenage years, I never wanted to date except the man I was going to marry. And I didn't just think it. I said it over and over and over again. And even though Barry and I, when we got married, it wasn't the ideal circumstances because he was older, he had been married, um, and he wasn't just on fire for the Lord. I knew that I knew that I knew that he was the one I was supposed to marry. And, and so... Um, and the Lord used my words and my confession to protect me from other potential suitors that did try to come into my life. And it never worked out. But it did work out with this man because he was supposed to be the one I was supposed to marry. So anyway, if you want that, then you can ask the Lord for that. And you can just join your faith and your words to that. And so, yes, I think it's better to just wait. I mean, why do you want to, you know, why do you want to date around and get your heart broken when you can have even better and just wait till that person. That being said, it stinks. If you want to be with someone, it stinks being alone. But if you don't learn to be alone with God, that's right. You won't be. That's right. Partnered with somebody else. That's good. And you won't know how to sustain a relationship with the Father once you get married, because you're going to want to put your spouse above your relationship with Father God, and that is not okay. That's not okay. Okay. We got more. All right. Um, okay. This one's, this would take a little bit more. So maybe we can give her, give this person some, I don't know if it's I her or him. Quick, give him a reference. Quick. Yeah, I can give him quick. Okay. Uh, I do have a reference for you. How do you break soul ties for good? This is a great. Don't go back. <laughs> yeah. Here's that's the best the first, way. That's the first key. Stop going back to their house or meeting them somewhere. Or kissing on them. Or kissing. That's right. <laughs> okay. Physical contact <laughs> tends to strengthen soul ties. Just so you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how to break soul right, ties Kim? for good. This could be with a boyfriend, girlfriend. It could be with a friend that you do not need to be friends with anymore. Any type of touch, int intimacy, prolonged talking will produce a soul tie. 
And so when that has happened and you need to break out of a relationship with someone, uh, there's a quick, easy way. You can uh, pray and ask the Lord, and ask Holy Spirit to break that soul tie in the spirit. Say, you know, just release that and ask Holy Spirit to break that soul tie. And he can do that. He absolutely can do that. I know from experience. And then secondly, what you need to do is any type of reminder of that individual, whether it be a photograph or it be something that that person gave you or it be the certain perfume or cologne that they wear that you have around your house or something, you need to get rid of it. Because you do not want a continual reminder of what you're trying to break free from. That's good. So if you ask the Lord, Holy Spirit to break that soul tie, but yet you still look at their Facebook or you still um, try to find ways to be around them, you're going to be right back in a vulnerable position for that soul tie to be reconnected. So um, just be very mindful. If you're going to break something off, do it with everything and don't look back. We've, we've dealt with, well, with a lot of situations like this. And I'll tell you that one of the main reasons there are great soul ties with people is because there's, uh, I said this last week, I think, because if you, if you enter into a sexual relationship with somebody, um, when that was meant for a man and woman to become one before God, yes. you still become one, yeah. but not before God. Yeah. So yeah. The, the leadership of the relationship changes. So the relationship is not led by Holy Spirit. It's led by fear. It's led by uh, anxiousness. It's led by um, jealousy. It's led by the enemy. Okay, and let me just say that, uh, yeah, we're moving forward. Okay. Soul ties are very strong. And when you're intimate with somebody, you, especially sexually intimate with somebody, you begin, you open yourself up. For everything Whatever that is have. attached to them to now be a, joined to you. And so you want to break that off uh, and be very, very... But you can. Yeah, you absolutely can. There's absolutely can. hope. There's hope. You absolutely can. And a great reference for soul ties would be, I love uh, Terry Savelle Foy's YouTube um, Just uh, YouTube message. Terry Savelle Foy soul ties. Breaking soul ties. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. How do you... This is, this is interesting. Um, how do you live with dead siblings on your mind? Um, that's, that's a hard thing. It that, is. That's a very hard you, thing. I've had, in, when I was growing up, I've had people that were fairly close to me die. And listen, everybody's built differently. I am, my personality is, and listen, because this can be hard. My personality is move on. My personality is I focus on where I'm going if, if, uh, and I'm going to go where I want to go, where I believe God's called me to go. So if there's something that drags me back or holds me back from that, I'm going to learn how to push it off and move forward. But here's, the, here's the, the truth to it is there's two sides. If they were a believer, then they're better off. Yeah, that's right. Especially if there was sickness involved. Yeah. If they weren't, then you do need the relief of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. You need the peace, the shalom peace of God to flood yeah. your heart and mind to be able to come to terms on that because Satan will try to bring guilt, yeah. condemnation, yeah. and all that kind of, he will try to get you to live in the spirit of grief. Yeah. Ecclesiastes says that there is a time for grief. Yeah. But it's a time. It's not all time. And so you have to learn to uh, you, you have to release it to the Lord because there's yeah. some things you're just not going to understand. And especially when people pass away prematurely, mm -hmm. uh, you need to know that it's not God's will. Yeah. I, recently, we had, I, my family had a longtime friend die at the age of 70. And at the funeral, the people said, uh, God had appointed this time to bring him home. That's a lie. It's a lie. John 10.10 10 says, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. That was Jesus' M.O. Life and life more abundantly. Now, whether we all reach it or not, we all have the chance to reach 120 years. Well, That's, that was the time God prescribed for man to live after the time of sin that they had been in. He prescribed for them. To, but you have to also treat yourself in a way that will help you get there. 
He yeah. goes, well, I'm going to do it. Not, you know, you got a McDonald's diet. It's not going to work. <laughs> it's a, did you see the thing on Facebook recently? Yeah. It was Ronald McDonald. And he said, uh, what did it say? He said. And he's smiling real big. You know, he's it always was just smiling. A three, it was, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to make you really, really fat. And so, but I want to add to that. I didn't know it said that. Um, I t- <laughs> okay. I want to add to that that Psalm 91 says that He will give us life until we're satisfied. Oh, so if you're not good. satisfied, it means your life's not ready to be over. So um, you know, until you're satisfied, then you know, if you're dealing with a sickness or you're dealing with depression or whatever that's trying to rob you of life. Uh, Psalm 91 promises you that he will give you long life. He will satisfy you with long life. And so if you're not satisfied, you need to just continue to receive um, what Jesus paid for and live until you're satisfied. And listen, if we didn't answer your question good enough, uh, we'll have prayer teams down front. And if you want uh, prayer over something, they'll be happy to pray with you, okay? Um, Let's see. When tithing, does one spouse give 10% or does both or do both give 10 percent i'll just i'm not going to answer you the way that maybe you want to be answered i don't know i'm going to tell you what we do so um amy has a checking account um because she just it's household income but she buys things for the kids and stuff and i manage our family account uh for bills and whatnot and then she has this thing where she buys clothes or and she gets groceries and stuff like that but that's not the point really what the point is is that when I get a check, if, if my check is for $750, I tithe $80. I don't, I don't do it after the taxes. I do it before because I don't want God to bless me on the net. I want him to bless me on the gross. Okay. So basically, if you and both, we both, do the same you thing. both work and you both receive an income, Profit. then you tithe the 10% on your entire income. You yeah. don't, you know, one of you doesn't tithe and the other one does. It's the household income because... You're both working, so. The bottom line is you want to be partnered with God financially, and that's the way to do it. Yep. That's what we believe, because that's what the Bible says. So anyway, that was fairly easy. Okay, how do you lead kids, to Christ, lead kids in, Christ, in Christ without trying to be pushy and restricting everything in this world, like music, that's TV, etc.? Uh, that is really we good. Won't, but we will not have the same answer on this. I'm just telling you. It's okay. I know. I'm just telling y'all, we don't have the same, we don't have the same, what? I'm stricter than she is, but it has to do with my upbringing. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure that's a big surprise to everybody. I, uh, you know, there is certain music that ticks me off because the people singing it know the truth. And when I hear, you know, Songs like I kissed a boy and I like it or I kissed a girl and I like it and you know fireworks and of course I know this is one artist right now. She gets really mad at me over this by the way. These artists are extremely talented. They're extremely creative and extremely anointed but they're using it in the wrong way I believe. And so I try to steer my kids away from listening to things, watching things, participating in things. They're going to be detrimental to their health spiritually. She does the same thing. But she just does it in different ways. But let me tell you this. Lots of times, I'm a stick in the mud. Just being transparent with you, she's nowhere near the mud. (laughs) Uh, And sometimes I have to bite my lip or my tongue to avoid an argument. Because you've got to ask yourself, is it really worth it? And so, and everybody's different. Everybody's different. You're, some of these questions are subjective to your environment and what your goal is. Okay. So the way I look at it is, for me, I'm not convicted to not listen to secular music. I don't have that conviction. Um, because if I listen to secular music, for me, I have a strength in that I know the truth and I listen to way more teaching and I listen to way more uh, worship than I do secular music. I enjoy music of all kinds. 
it's fun to me. So when the children are in the car with me, they're going to listen to whatever I feel like listening. <laughs> and so I don't listen now. If it's something really bad or destructive, we don't listen to that. But um, do we listen to some of the tunes of today? Heck yeah, we do. <laughs> because some of them are really good. And we have fun with that. But I don't, I personally am not convicted that that's sin for me. And so, but what I do is I guard what we do listen to to a certain point. If I think that it's feeding something in them that it should not be feeding. I try to cultivate in my children the ability to be in the world but not be of the world and so there's certain things I mean we go see movies I mean come no, on people don't. no we don't okay we, we see don't movies. we do not go to the secular media big shows I'm just joking I'm just he's gonna part and <laughs> Am I, am I, do I feel like that's sin for us? No, I don't feel like that's sin for us. But somebody, but let me finish. Okay. But some people in their personal lives may choose, or it may be a conviction for them not to watch TV and not to watch secular music, or listen to secular music. And that is 100% okay. And that is for you, and that is for your family, and you do what Holy Spirit leads your right. family to do. And so you you cannot judge some you, you cannot go. judge someone else's <laughs> standards um, according to your standards, standards yeah. because they, everybody has a different standard, and whole, and it doesn't mean that one's wrong and the other one's right. Okay. And so and I'll, I'll say this: <laughs> Did y'all get it? <laughs> <clears throat> My parents' generation, I could not watch the A-team, the old A-team, not the Bradley Cooper A-team. I could not watch B.A. Baracus. I could not watch, because they thought, this is too destructive, it's too violent. It was also right in the middle of the charismatic renewal, which they were involved in, and you shunned everything that was the world. And so what happens in Christianity is we have a pendulum swing, and if we, like the prosperity movement, is God's will prosperity? Absolutely. Is it his prosperity? Is it his will that we swing over into the ditch and everything's about money? Absolutely not. Couldn't be further from the truth. But what we tend to do as people is we tend to swing either from far right to far left. Yeah. And so, and I don't like the word balance because I think it's a secret word for mediocrity. But I think that we have to, every family has to judge for itself what the Lord would have you do. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's like uh, questions like, are, you know, are tattoos wrong? Well, you ask some people and they think that they're from hell and you shouldn't do it. You ask other people and they think, well, yeah, they're okay. And there's, also, there's obviously a lot of diversity in the body of Christ where this is concerned. But what Amy said was good. You don't judge somebody else from where you are. You, don't, you really don't judge anybody, period. You love them where they are. And, uh, you know, if the truth be known, we've all got cobwebs in our closets that we probably don't want people poking in and seeing. So if you don't want people to see yours, don't poke into theirs. Yeah. We lead by example. Okay. This is a good one. What if one partner doesn't agree tithing? This is how I feel about it. Um, if one partner doesn't agree to tithing, if you both, if that partner that doesn't agree is the breadwinner, so to speak, of the family, um, then you can either ask them for, you know, their permission to tithe, even though they don't agree with it. Um, and if they don't, and um, they don't agree with tithing, then Holy Spirit and Dad knows what's going on in your relationship. And he understands uh, a spouse that wants to respect the wishes of the other spouse. And so that's something that you always, always, always want to uh, be sensitive to where that other person is. And by going ahead and tithing, even though it's totally against them, it may put them farther away than it actually brings them to God. And so um, God's not going to, I mean, we all know that Jesus took the curse for us. So tithing doesn't mean that you're keeping the curse away. That's, that's, um, that's not what tithing means. Tithing just put you in covenant with father with your finances but if you are the if you have your own job you both have your own job and the other spouse doesn't agree to tithing but you do want to tithe then you have uh the right to tithe on your paycheck but you want to be in agreement you don't want it to be a source of tension 
No, I agree with you. You don't want it yeah. to be a source of strife. And so I believe that there's a way to come into agreement on it. And, and if, you, if you tell your, your spouse, say, hey, I'm really, this is a conviction I have and I have a job. And so I'm just going to ask you to agree that, that I just do. And, and something you can tell them is, hey, I'm going to prove it to you. That's good. Jesus, because the word says in Malachi 3, try me now in this. Prove me out in this. And so you can prove it in a good way, not like, I told you so. You know, don't do that. You know, don't, don't let pride enter into it. But, you know, uh, I think that there's ways to do everything in love where you don't tick people off every day. You know, you don't want to do that. You have to live with the person. So This is our last question. Pro, yeah, so we'll shut it down after this. Now, I want to say there are things that we have said that you may not agree with. That's okay. Yeah. We're not asking everybody to agree with us on everything. Yeah. It's okay. I disagree with Amy on a lot of things, but we're still together. And we practice the culture of honor in our home. That even though we disagree with one another on certain things, we still honor that person. We still love them. So. Yeah. And, you know, there was once I said, because I quoted John 10.10, 10, there was a, a statement that came in about um, in Deuteronomy 32.39, there is, I know, I know, I'm just addressing this. There is no God besides me I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver out of my hand. My response to that is you have to look at the way that the Old Testament was written, when it was written, and who it was written by. There are causative statements in the Old Testament that put a lot of blame on God. My question is this for you. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if Jesus was the exact representation of the Father and he said, I came to give life and life more abundantly, then you just need to study it out. And you'll find that in the Old Testament, lots of times when I will do this and I destroyed and I did that, look at the reason why. It was oftentimes because the nation of Israel, the children of God, stepped out from under his protection. If they were in his protection and listening and doing what he said to do, there was no danger. But when they stepped out of the protection, there was a lot of danger. But you can't, but just so people don't take condemnation, if you've had a child die or you've had that oh, circumstance yeah. in your life, it doesn't mean that you did something wrong and you and stepped out from protection. And they said something really good protection. about the understanding. Yeah, you should read that. It said God gives life and God takes it away. Um, I believe that God receives a life yeah. in death. He, yeah. we, I just did a, 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 a funeral for a two-month-old baby. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. What do you say? There's nothing to say. Nothing's going to bring comfort to those two people. I had a great pastor tell me one time, sometimes all you can do is just love people. You just hug them and you love them and you tell them it's going to be okay. Yeah. And you may not even know how it's going to be okay. But it's going to be okay. And so in that time, I just prayed with the both of them. And you know, when you quote the word and when you say the word, people ain't always going to like it. Well, but, and, 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 but again, on this situation, okay. we live next to a family that lost two children. Golly, lost the two children. The berries. <clears throat> we live next to the berries. And you don't go up to them and say, well, you must have done something wrong for your children to have gone. Oh, I mean, that is the worst, cruelest crazy. thing to ever say. And that is not God. That is not God. That's man's cheap way out. Yeah. So there are times that things happen and, you know, that children have died prematurely. And he said, you just keep looking forward. This could be a major distraction. It could alter your life forever if you don't continue to look forward and trust me, even in the midst of something so tragic like that taking place in your life. You just keep moving forward. And so, um, you know, the... The best thing I know to do in that situation is just to love someone and never, ever put the blame on God as the taker of life, but always say, you know what? We may not understand how this happened, but we know God is good, and we're going to keep trusting him, and we're going to keep moving forward because, you know, that's, that's what the word shows us in the New Testament, that God is a giver and not a taker. And Old Testament was written in a, a way that it did put blame on God, but it was actually a uh, misinterpretation when they were translating it, and it was the curse brought the, the destruction. Curse brought the destruction. Not God. The curse did. And so Israel continued to disobey God, even though he made it very clear to them, choose life, not death. And when they chose death, they reached death. death. They experienced death. Deuteronomy thirty nineteen. Moses said, I set before you this day life and death. Choose life. It's an open book test. I'm telling you the answer.
Okay, so the, the question on that was how do you know um, it's the right person and how do you put yourself in a position to find them? I, no relationship is proven until it's been tested. Those are some Boy, of the best true. words that I've ever heard in my life. I'll tell you, so, let me tell you the story. Okay. I was about, when I was, the first time I was married, this guy, Dale Mock, just a very awesome man. He's in TV for Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And we were talking one day because I was unsure and he said, let the stew simmer. Yeah, I'm like, what? Let this, I'm, not, I'm not eating right now. I need advice. <clears throat> he said, let the stew simmer. When the heat's turned on, everything at the bottom will come to the top. When it starts boiling, everything will come to the top and you'll see everything. And so what she said is, and, and my dad's told me this, there is no true relationship until there's been a true test. Yeah. And, and that's just, and my sister, when she got married, when she was 36 and she, uh, she, she dated several people and brought several people to my father and, and he would tell them all the same thing. I don't know that you love my daughter because you haven't had a test. I'll know when you have had a test, when you have the opportunity to hate, but you choose love. Okay. Okay, so I want to say this. Um, if you're in the middle of dating someone or you're looking for that right person or whatever, don't rush it. Allow the relationship to, to go through some ups and downs. Allow the relationship to be tested. Don't rush it. Uh, because once you're married, you're married. <laughs> and, you know, you may find out something that if you'd have just waited a few months longer would have totally changed your mind. But here's something that I saw on Facebook a few months ago. This guy... Uh, decided to ask his fiance or his girlfriend to marry him, but what he did oh. was he recorded himself. This guy ruined it for all other guys. Every day for a whole year, asking his girlfriend to marry him wow. in different ways. Every day, she knew nothing about this. So. Every day he recorded himself brushing his teeth and said, such and such, will you marry me? Or he was uh, sitting on the couch or, and he was typing and then he'd hold up a sign saying, such and such, will you marry me? And he did this every day for a whole year. Then on the day he decided to ask her to marry him, she, he showed her the video of him asking every day. Of him. And let me just say, in a year, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have... <laughs> you're not going to want to turn the video camera on. There off. were days, I'm sure, that this today. guy probably didn't want to ask her to marry him that day. But he did it anyway. And so a whole year of every day asking this girl to marry him. Then he showed her the video and she's weeping and I'm crying. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy. But you know what? You're a real jerk. He was committed. He was committed. So... <clears throat> No, it made me. I've always been romantic, but I wasn't willing to wait that long, I'll tell you what. Because here's what you want to know. Here's what nope. you want to know is that I chose you and that I'm committed to this relationship no matter how bad or rough yeah. of a patch we go through. I chose you. I still choose you, and I will never change. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. No. And uh, just so, just throwing this in, the King James Version of the Bible, which a lot of people say there is no other version, the King James is not actually word for word literal translation of the Hebrew or the Greek. It was written by scribes with King James standing over their shoulder telling them how to write. <clears throat> Just telling you. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> it's, it's a great translation. Yeah, it is. The New King James I love, the Amphite I love. But just realize that you have to get into the Word and find out how it complements itself, not how it contradicts itself. Amen. Amen. That's so good. Okay. Is Amen. this okay? Um, so next service, I kind of erased most of those questions besides the compliments. I'm going to keep those. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to print them out. <clears throat> well, I kind of lined them up. So we'll have these as backups uh, for next service. But we just want to release you guys today. We want to love you. Let's just pray over people and uh, if our prayer teams or our ministry teams could come up, if you have, if you need prayer on something, if you're having difficulty with something right now, also if you want uh, WSTM information, Jake will be back at one of the doors and he'll have some of that to give to you as you go. Um, but we just want to pray peace over you and uh, just believe that Holy Spirit's going to lead you and guide you in everything that you do. Amen. And listen, if you're a, a family feet. member of the Way Church. 
Uh, I just had it on my heart to let you know that Barry and I and our staff and team, we pray for you all the time. Yeah. And we declare over you that no tragedy will come near your dwelling, that your families are blessed, that your children are protected, um, that you're discovering your good life every day, all the time. Your purpose is becoming clearer and clearer. So these are some things that are being prayed over you and spoken over you. And uh, because we love you and we, we really long to see each person discover who they are in Christ and their good right. life. Why don't you bless them? Okay. Father, I just bless our, our people. I bless this family, Lord. Yes. I bless them with long life. I bless them with health. I bless them with prosperity. I declare over them that their purpose is becoming clearer and clearer, Amen. that they have eyes to see and ears to hear, that they love wisdom. They choose wisdom. They go after wisdom. And, Lord, I just declare that this week of their life will be great, will be wonderful. It may not be without challenges, but I declare that they have wisdom in every challenge, that they know exactly exactly what to do and they get stronger and better every time they face adversity because they see themselves as overcomers as more than conquerors because that's who they are in Christ Jesus and so I release that over our people I love them and I bless them today in Jesus name amen, amen. you all have a great day we'll see you next week <laughs>